Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on how to interpret Scripture. And this is the last lesson in that series entitled Living by the Word of God, lesson number 13 for June 27 of 2020. This has been a very provocative and very worthwhile series of lessons. I hope you've had an opportunity to hear each one of them. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the extreme lengths to which you've gone to preserve for us this wonderful record that we call the Bible. Think of the times so long ago that these things were written down by people using some ancient languages and so forth, and that it has been preserved and, and we can read it in modern English. It's amazing. So now let's ask the question, how do we live what we have learned? And that will be our question for today. May you guide us as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How would you like to have the world's wisest person be your constant guide? Well, you can do one better than that. God offers you something even better. The inspired records provide wisdom beyond any human's capacity. Our only problem is understanding it and following it. Even knowing what the scripture says is not going to help very much if we do not live by its direction. You know, even the Bible says, you know, the guy who see, looks at his face and looks at his face in the mirror, sees it's dirty and walks away and doesn't do anything. What did he accomplish? Nothing, right? The scriptures are a treasure house of information about how God has dealt with rebellion in his universe and how he has guided various people through the centuries in their own lives. So what we have really is a history of how God has dealt with sin, how God has dealt with sinful bunch of rebels like we are, and we, we see how he deals with those, has dealt with those things all down through the years. Think particularly of the life of Jesus himself. We wish, of course, that we knew more about his childhood and youth. The three chapters in Desire of Ages about the youth of Jesus are incredibly challenging and insightful. So are we prepared to start thinking about living God's way? Well, during this quarter, we have studied some difficult approaches, I'm sorry, some different approaches to understanding Scripture. But are we willing to live according to what we have learned? What would happen if everyone in the Seventh-day Adventist Church were actually living up to the guidance that she or he already has available from Scripture? We'd be in heaven. Do you remember Ellen White's words in 1883? If every Adventist, she was talking about the ones back from 1843 and 1844, before they, long before there was a Seventh-day Adventist church, she said if all those people had followed on the way God wanted them to do, we would now be in heaven. 1883. I guess maybe we should be thankful they didn't, otherwise we, yeah. we would never have been born. But Anyway. Look at Philippians 2, 12 to 16. So then, dear friends, as you always obeyed me when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey me now while I'm away from you. Keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. You must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky as you offer them the message of life. I, if you do so, I shall have reason to be proud of you on the day of Christ because it will show that all my effort and work have not been wasted. Wow. Paul was in prison when he wrote those words in Rome. He thought there was a chance that he would be released soon, and it turns out he was. And he was writing to his friends in Philippi, and so he, could be, he was planning to visit them shortly. He encouraged them to get along, not to argue or complain, but to shine like the stars lighting up the sky. He wanted to be, a proud, wanted to be proud of those with whom he had worked, he had worked to, in giving the, to give the gospel. Let us remember that the most important work that the Holy Spirit has done relative to this earth 
is the giving of the scriptures. If you pick up the Bible in your hand, what are you looking at? You're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit, right? In our day, the Holy Spirit not only helps us to read and understand the scriptures, but also he can help us understand and follow God's directions. And what happens if we do not follow God's directions? Romans 1.25, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the creator himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. American Bible Society, 1992. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. In the Lord's name, when I warn you, do not continue to live like the heathen whose thoughts are worthless and whose minds are in dark. It's going to be in the dark. They have no part in the life that God gives, for they are completely ignorant and stubborn. That's not a very good picture, is it? If you turn away from God's way, you're in pretty bad shape. So do we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the best teacher this world has ever had? He wants to, I, I suppose we should say, with the exception of Jesus, maybe. Mm -hmm. He wants to help us understand the scriptures. He wants us to he wants to bring the truth of God's word into our daily lives. Carrie? No one is able to explain the scriptures without the aid of the Holy Spirit. But when you take up the word of God with a humble, teachable heart, the angels of God will be by your side to impress you with evidences of the truth. And that comes from Mrs. White, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, February 18, 1890. Wow. So that's what we're trying to do here. So we, before our purpose for praying, before we begin these sessions, we're trying to explain the scriptures here. We're trying to understand it ourselves, and we're trying to share what we have learned. And so we, we, we are wasting our time here if we do not have the Holy Spirit helping us. Have you had the experience of having the Holy Spirit help you to understand some challenging portions of scripture? How is that supposed to work? Obviously, we don't see the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a couple of passages. I'm going to choose to read this one from Isaiah 50. The sovereign Lord has taught me what to say so that I can strengthen the weary. Every morning he makes me eager to hear what he's going to teach me. The Lord has given me understanding and I have not rebelled or turned away from him. I bared my back to those who beat me. I did not stop them when they insult, insulted me, when they pulled out the hairs of my beard and spat in my face. But their insults cannot hurt me because the sovereign Lord gives me help. I brace myself to endure them. I know that I will not be disgraced, for God is near and he will prove me innocent. Hmm. Wow. How is it that God's faithful people can understand things that do not make any sense to those who do not have the Holy Spirit's guidance? We're going to read a passage in several different times through the course of this lesson that will, that will emphasize that. We need to remember that the real reason for having church organizations is to facilitate the spreading of the gospel to those who have not yet received the message. There is, it's so easy for us to think that the church is a nice club we go to and on Sabbath mornings and we spend, we, we meet all our friends and we enjoy it and we go home, had a good time. No, the purpose of a church is to organize us so we can spread the gospel to others. Amen. That's the whole purpose. And I might add, our whole next series of lessons for next quarter are going to be about that. But how can we clearly explain the truths of the Bible if we do not understand them ourselves? And I've often said, and you've heard some of you have heard me say this, if you want to know whether or not you understand something, try explaining it to someone else. Yeah. And I think sometimes... I think all of us that are a bit older, sometimes it looks at, like it's almost a business, mm -hmm. the church. I know we have to have organization, but there are feelings sometimes you just wonder. Well, you, if you look at Revelation 1, and uh, even it spills over in Revelation 2 and 3, it just says there clearly the, perp the, the churches are supposed to be lights to the world. That's what we're here for. If we're not lighting the way to the world, we don't really have any reason for existence. Well, how much of Scripture have you memorized? 
I wish I could do more. Well, How much well, can you still? Yeah, yeah. I, I, will, I will tell you that many, many years ago when I was a very young man, I memorized the book of James. And a number of years later, I got more interested in Romans and I memorized the whole book of Romans. But I can't do it now. I need to go back and review. Huh? <laughs> many of us had memory verses that we learned in times past, but they have slipped from our memories. When dealing with Satan's temptations, wouldn't it be good to have a number of scriptures stored in our memory for ready access? That is what Jesus did. Do you remember Luke 4? But Jesus answered, the scripture says, human beings cannot live on bread alone. And then he goes on and you know, repeatedly says, every word that proceedeth out. Look, I'll just read you these. For the scripture says, God will order his angels to take care of you. It also says they will hold you up with, your hand, with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished tempting Jesus, in every way he left him for a while. I, every once in a while I stop and, you know, it, one of the ways to defeat an enemy is to understand their plans. Right? Yeah. So once in a while, we have to stop and think the way the devil thinks. And I, 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 when I think about that, when I ask myself that question, I say, try to imagine the devil. And here's a baby boy born. And you can be sure that he said to all these angels, look at this yeah. little tiny baby. Not one single person living on this earth has survived without sinning. You think this baby is going to survive without sinning? No way. And so they probably, he probably said to them, I will personally take responsibility for making sure this baby sins. <laughs> In uh, Adventist college, um, dean of student affairs, Sabbath school class, uh, I was foolish enough to be teaching and then <clears throat> he raises his hand and he says, you know, uh, before Jesus was 12 or so, he did commit sins. So why God on his case in no, like no one's business? And there were some missionaries in the class. And uh, one of them says, I'm so glad Charles you stood your ground. I mean, so what's our conviction really truly? Who do we think this God man is, was? You see, when we, that, that changes our whole a whole perspective of life. God said kind of back in the beginning, speaking to the devil, it says, people will, will live according to my, my laws and practice them and right through their lives and you will not get them to change no matter what you do. And Satan says, that'll never happen. God says, just watch. Just watch. And yeah. Jesus lived a perfect life. And another group of people is coming up at the end of this world's history, not who have never been sinners, but who have come to know God well enough so they will, they will sit, stand firm during the time, the worst time in, in human history. And they will say, no, God, we have come to understand you and we are committed to, I mean, let, even if they kill us, we will not give up what we believe because we know it's the truth. Amen. And God will say, okay, now we can, now we can bring it to an end. Well, the record suggests that there was some in Jesus' day who memorized the entire Old Testament in the original language. God is not asking you to do that much today. But we can see from the story of Jesus that he had memorized significant portions of the Old Testament and had appropriate Bible texts available in memory whenever needed. Quoting the Bible is probably the best possible response we can give to Satan when he attacks us. Repeatedly, Jesus answered his critics by referring them to Scripture. For example, um, just take one, Luke 24, 45, and 46. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and, they, and, and said to them, This is what is written, the Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Wow. Look at Matthew 10, 11, 11, 10, I'm sorry. For John is the one whom the scripture says, God said, I will send my messenger ahead of you to open the way for you. So what is God saying? His, 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 his word is, is there to help us for these, when we get into challenges. 
Did Jesus know from his association with God the Father that the words he was quoting from the Old Testament were words that he himself had inspired? Did he ever try to tell his disciples that? Uh, not that I can think about. <laughs> not sure of that. I mean, did uh, he? Did, he must have understood it himself. Of course, yeah. What I wonder is how we survive. Yeah. I mean, the food we eat today, there's good food if you look for it. Back in his day, you were lucky to get a meal a day most of the... And, and then he'd be up all night praying and stuff mm -hmm. like this. How did he have the stamina? I've often wondered that. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's interesting that if you read Desire of Ages, page 70, paragraph 1, it says there specifically that God himself taught Jesus when he was young, as a child. Mm. He met with him and taught him. Exactly. And the angels came and taught him as well. So he had, he had some good instructors. Yeah, but I, I've often wondered, did they feed him anything? <laughs> I mean, he, a he, good question. he was a carpenter and all that, yeah. but as far as I know, we don't know. But how did he have enough calories yeah. go into him? Um, his early life was certainly not a bit of roses, I'll tell you that. No. Uh, he worked in carpenter's shop, yes. Right. But what happened when he went to fetch water? Yeah. Well, the when in those days, even now in certain areas, if indeed your mother got pregnant when she was 16 and no one knew who the father yeah. was, aha, you are done. Yeah. So can you picture that ridicule, even stones oh, being yeah. thrown at him? Yeah. Uh, it's what he went through and knowing that he's God himself. Yeah. He did not call uh, two female uh, lions or uh, bears, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, what has been your own personal experience in quoting script in response to temptation? How can we do that on a practical basis? Sin cannot be stamped out. It must be crowded out with thoughts and ideas from God. Only by filling our minds with God's ideas as recorded in the Bible can we be prepared to meet Satan and his angels when they attack us. Is that from Ellen White? Sin cannot be cannot be stamped, stamped out. out. It has to be crowded out. out. Oh, wh what is that one? I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah, that was in number fifteen there. Number fifteen. Okay, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. In John five and again in John eight, Jesus responded to the tax of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he was blunt. It's amazing. He said that they were not following the guidelines set down in the Pentateuch by Moses because if they were, they would have accepted him because it was all about him. <laughs> As recorded in John 8, he went on to say three times that he, in fact, was and is God. And I'm going let, to, let's gonna look at that really quick. The first time was in, in verse 24, John 8, verse 24. That is why I told you that, I, that you will die in your sins, and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. And what is that word? The great I am. The great I am. Yes. That's the name of God. Who are you, they asked him. Jesus answered, what I have told you from the very beginning. I have much to say to you about, much to, to say about you, much to condemn you for. The one who sent me, however, is truthful, and I, and I tell you the world only. What, I tell the world only what I have heard from him. And you drop down. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. So he said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Who is he saying he is? God. And you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And they, then they went on. They had a bunch of other discussions. I'm not going to read that part. Finally, they get down to chapter, I mean, to verse 44. And uh, he says to them, you are the children of your father, the devil. Yes. Whoa. Yes. And you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and he has never been on the side of truth. 
because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he's a liar and the father of all lies. I mean, he's speaking to the church leaders, the, the general conference, if you will, in session, the Sanhedrin. Yeah. Wow. He's head in the but lion's I, mouth. Yeah, but I tell you the truth, and that is why you do not believe me. Which one of you can prove that I'm guilty of sin? Which one of you? Mm. If I tell the truth, then why do you not believe me? He who comes from God listens to God's words. You, whoever, you however, are not from God, and that is why you will not, will not listen. They asked Jesus, were, were we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon in you? So they throw the same thing back at him. Yes. I have no demon, Jesus answered. I honor my father, but you will dishonor me. I'm not seeking to honor myself anyway. Drops down. They said to him, uh, in verse 51, I'm telling you the truth. Whoever obeys my teaching will never die. They said to him, now we are certain that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets died. Yet you say that whoever obeys your teaching will never die. Our father Abraham died. You do not claim to be greater than Abraham, do you? And the prophets also died. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, If I were to honor myself, that honor would be worth nothing. And he drops down. I'm going to read down at verse 57. Then they said to him, You are not even 50 years old, and you have, been, you have seen Abraham? Well, he said, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. They said to him, You're not even 50 years old. And you are, have seen Abraham? I'm telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was One. born, I am. Yes. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Wow. Yeah. Finally, he said it so clearly they could not miss it. And what was their response? They tried to stone him. Stone him. There are some Christians who claim that they are following Jesus in contradistinction to the Old Testament. They like to quote Matthew 5, and you know, he says, it has been, it has been said, but I say. It has been, you, you were told, but I say. You were told, but I say. And so they, they say, well, you see, we can, the Old Testament is out of fashion, it's old. All we need is a New Testament. Well, Jesus appeared to, appeared to contrast what was written in the Old Testament with what he was teaching in his day. Jesus was not trying to throw out the Old Testament. He was interpreting it and teaching it in a more expanded way. If we follow his directions in the Sermon on the Mount, we will not have to worry about breaking any of the laws written in the Old Testament. That's for sure. There are some in our day who want to separate the gospel from the teachings of the Bible. That might seem strange to those of us who consider the Bible to be a guide for our lives. So what do they mean when they say we want to separate the gospel from the teachings of the Bible? What are they really saying? We want to take the gospel as we interpret it and not to, to tie ourselves down to what the Bible actually says. So what they're really saying is we're putting our judgment over the Bible. One of the most famous examples of someone who saw a separation between the, his teachings and the doctrines of the Bible was Martin Luther. Look at these comments. All the genuine sacred books agree in this, that all of them preach and include, include, incul, inculcate Christ. Christ. Yeah. And That's that is the Bible. true test by which to judge all books when we see whether or not they in, in, inculcate Christ. This is Martin Luther, Luther's Works, Volume 35, Word and Sacrament 1. Briefly, Christ This is Martin Luther continuing. Briefly, Christ is the Lord, not the servant, the Lord of the Sabbath, of the law, and of all things. The scriptures must be understood in favor of Christ, not against him. For that reason, they must either refer to him or must not be held to be true scriptures. Therefore, if the adversaries press the scriptures against Christ, we urge Christ against the scriptures. We have the Lord, they the servants. We have the head. They, the feet, are members, over which the head necessarily dominates, 
and takes precedence. Now, let me interrupt for a second. What's Martin Luther talking about here? He's saying, we have the scriptures, we have the word straight from God, from the original translations. We're putting that in contrast to the Roman Catholic interpretations they, that he had grown up with. So that's really what he's talking about here. Go ahead. Not against other scriptures. Not against talking, other scriptures. Right. If one of them had to be parted with Christ or the law, the law would have to be let go of. Not Christ. Mm. I lost it. No. Go off. Not Christ. For if we have Christ, we can easily establish laws and we shall judge all things rightly. Okay, so what is he saying there? This, we shall judge all things rightly. Rightly. Yeah. So he's saying our interpretation. It's shaky. Okay, go ahead. Is this the laws of prevailing laws of the land at the time that he's talking about? No, he's talking about the interpretations of the church. The interpretations of the church. Yeah. Okay. Indeed, we would make new decalogues as Paul does in all the epistles and Peter, but above all, Christ in the gospel. And these decalogues are clearer than the decalogues of Moses, just as the countenance of Christ is better, brighter than the countenance of Moses. Second Corinthians 3, 7 and 11. This is Martin Luther again, Luther's works. A comment on the last, last uh, sentence, please. Yeah. So he's saying, what he's really saying is he believed that, that Paul had reinterpreted and given new new meanings to the t Ten Commandments. <clears throat> he said the one that the Moses gave in the Old Testament, that was good, but Paul did it better. So he's saying basically Paul reinvented the Decalogue, which isn't really true, but that was his, his interpretation there. And so he says, and we can do the same thing. We can reinterpret the law. We can come up with better ideas than the one that Moses had, which of course we wouldn't agree with. That's the point. That's what I wanted to, that, uh, yeah, Jesus made, he says, you have heard this said, uh, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. But let me tell you, that's the letter of the law. Mind the spirit of the law, whoever looks at a woman with lust. Yeah. So how can we even improve on that? Yeah, exactly. To me, that's He's the not point. He's not doing away with the Old Testament. He's make it strong, making it stronger. Yeah, there you are. We believe that Scripture must be interpreted in light of the life and teachings of Jesus. We would all agree with that. They cannot be set against each other. Luther used his ideas of sola scriptura and the Christomanistic principle to downplay the usefulness of five books in the New Testament. He, he didn't know for sure what to do with Hebrews, James, Second Peter, Jude, and Revelation. Imagine what the Seventh Day Adventist Church would be without Hebrews and especially without Revelation. But he kind of gave in, right? Later on, he accepted all of them, or well, what he did is he put them in a separate section at the end of his Bible, kind of like an apocrypha. Yeah, even to the end of his life. Yep. Yeah. Because it didn't teach Christ. That's that's basically. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The way he thought it, the way he thought they they should teach Christ. And Hebrew of all things. Hebrews. Yeah. It yep. said well, in the book of James. He called it straw. It? Yeah. It, it, it just book uh, of straw. And, you know, yeah. Some. Well, he had some uh, uh, very crazy ideas. He says he hated the Jews. He says the best way to Baptize a Jew is to hang him from the high take, take tallest him. bridge in uh, Germany, and now you now baptize you in the name of yeah. your father you, Abraham and you drop tie, him. You tie a millstone <laughs> around his neck and throw him into the Elbe River. I'm telling him he was baptized in the name of his father Abraham, that Isaac, is and Jacob. <laughs> but that's, that's table talks number seventeen, nineteen, I think, or something like seventeen yeah. twenty-nine. Well, here's what yeah. happened. Let, let me explain that a little bit. Luther got so excited when he was able to actually read the Bible in the original language and realized that everything that, that he came to stand for and so forth, 
uh, that he thought, the little while later, he thought, you know what? I'm now learning these languages of Hebrew and Greek and so forth. The Jews have had these languages all their, all their lives. Mm -hmm. They're scholars. They, they must know all about the gospel. And he went to them and he went to them with the idea, of, wow, it's so exciting that you guys believe all these things. We don't believe those things. He couldn't believe that they hadn't figured out all the things that he, he thought he was discovering, especially in the New Testament, which, of course, they weren't primarily about the New Testament. And so, as a result, he turned against them he, and he wanted to baptize them by <laughs> drowning them. Well, Jesus made the instructions he gave so clear it was almost impossible to misunderstand them. Trying to set aside certain portions of the Old Testament as perhaps uninspired because of something Jesus said, as recorded in the New Testament, is one of the subtlest and perhaps most dangerous criticisms of Scripture. Remember that the Bible that Jesus and the disciples had was only what we call the Old Testament. Jesus specifically said that he was not trying to contradict the Old Testament. Matthew 5, 17 to 19 says, Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with, not until the end of all things. So then, whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Mm. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And the law he was talking about was the Old Testament. That was the only Bible they had in their day. Can you Think about this out there. Can you name any teaching found in the New Testament that really directly contradicts what is said in the Old Testament? In fact, there are many things which are spelled out in the Old Testament that are not spelled out in the New Testament, but which are foundational to our understanding of the whole of Scripture. Think of the creation story. It's just mentioned offhand in the New Testament, but think of all the details about how Adam and Eve were created and how they sinned and so forth. Um, the story of the fall, I mentioned. And later, the account of the flood, mentioned just in passing in the New Testament. The Old Testament clearly teaches that the Messiah Christ would come. And in the New Testament, we read about it, that first coming. But the New Testament goes on to further expand God's plan for this earth by explaining that he will come a second time and yet again a third time to make this world his future headquarters. Wow. So why is it that so few of us find time to really read and study the scriptures? Our lives tend to be hectic, and there is always something to distract us. Solomon reminded us in the book of Ecclesiastes that none of this world's attractions have any permanence. How can we deliberately and intentionally set aside some time every day to respectfully and quietly study God's word and pray? Remember that the one we're talking to when we pray actually holds our lives in his hands. Do you remember Acts 17? Where does this come from? What was going on in Acts 17? This is Paul speaking to the Athenians, the men of Athens. And a couple of places, verse 25, nor does he, God, need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And if you drop down to verse 28, as someone has said, and he actually quotes one of their ancient prophets, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. And unfortunately, Despite all that, they didn't make much of his speech. Only a few of them believed. Well, read Psalm 37, 7 and 46, 10. I'll read that one. Stop fighting, he says, and know that I am God, supreme among the nations, supreme over the world. Uh, that's not what I was looking for, is it? Yeah, I'm sorry, it was. These verses and those others, these verses suggest that God wants to have an appointment with us only on a daily basis, and he needs to have our undivided attention during that time. 
if, by the way, and I've, I've asked this question before, wouldn't you like to have a, maybe a 15-minute appointment with God every week? <laughs> wouldn't that well, be got, nice? Yes. You got one that would just happen. That's 24 hours available yeah. to you. The problem is if we actually had a personal visit with God once a week, guess who would demand equal time? <laughs> yes, the devil. Can you imagine spending 15 minutes with the devil? Hmm. Well, he, he has access all the time. Yeah? <laughs> we see what he's up to. Personal experience, right? <laughs> well, just be a, just a observer in life. You can, yeah. You know, you know. Well, if we truly love someone, wouldn't we love to spend time with him or her? Do you have a special place where you go and you can go and talk to God in private? Beginning your day with God will prove to be a huge benefit. Have we... And I, I am sure that Jesus spent many nights, probably entire nights, talking with his father. And they planned every day. I'm sure he knew in advance exactly what was going to happen every day. Have we outgrown our need to memorize scripture? We did a lot of scripture. You know, kids are expected to memorize a lot of scripture. Yeah. Having access to the scriptures in a word-by-word -word memorized form can prove to be a huge benefit. Do you remember those days, 13th Sabbath? Yep. 13th Sabbath would go and parrot out all those scriptures. Yeah. Kids would stand up and pe pe oh, repeat all 13. We did it. <laughs> yeah. One way to memorize scripture is to learn scripture songs. I love those. But Jim, I think you've got something to add there. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. Do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and psalms to the Lord with praise in your heart. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks for everything to, for everything to God the Father. Good News Bible. And you notice it says, don't get drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit capitalized. Yeah. Go ahead, Colossians. Colossians 3.16, Christ's message to all is in richness all. Christ is in, all in its riches must live in our hearts, in your hearts. Teach and instruct each one with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. I can tell you that um, when I was a missionary in Africa many years ago and my children were going up, we, got, we actually got from a certain place a whole, a little book, wasn't, wasn't big, but it had quite a, quite a few scripture songs. And every week we would learn a new scripture song. I can still sing those songs. I love those songs. Yeah. And they're, if you learn, a, you learn a Bible verse to, to the tune of a certain music, it'll, you'll remember it. The thing that always hits my mind is Handel's Messiah. Oh, boy. It's just amazing. Well, singing God's word is a blessing. Combining the words of Scripture with brief but beautiful melodies is a tremendous aid to memorizing. Carrie? Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble, and elevating, and to awaken in the soul devotion and gratitude to God. What a contrast between the ancient custom and the uses to which music is now too often devoted. How many employ this gift to exalt self instead of using it to glorify God? A love for music leads the unwary to unite with world lovers in pleasure gatherings where God has forbidden his children to go. Thus, that which is a great blessing when rightly used becomes one of the most successful agencies by which Satan allures the mind from duty and from the contemplation of eternal things. Music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above, and we should endeavor in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. Wow. The proper training of the voice is an important feature in education and should not be neglected. Singing as a part of religious service is as much an act of worship as is prayer. The heart must feel the spirit of the song to give it the right expression. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White, page 594, paragraphs 2 and 3. Wow. Amazing. 
we we get some lovely music here in at the University Church here in Loma Linda. And we have an organ, a pipe organ, a church that's just fantastic. I love yes. to listen to it. Yeah. But I'm afraid it will be pretty much second fiddle when it, compared to what we're going to hear in heaven. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've, any of you had the opportunity. They, they used to, and I don't know whether they still do this or not, but years ago they would, they would get together a bunch of choirs and they would practice before and they'd come together and there'd be like a 200-voice choir would sing at the general conference. Wow. Yes. Just amazing. So imagine 200 voice, maybe 2,000 or 2 million angels singing in perfect harmony. Yes. What would that be like? Amazing. So what else can the Holy Spirit do for us, Charles? The natural eye can never behold the comeliness and beauty of Christ. The inward illumination, illumination. illumination of the Holy Spirit revealing to the soul its true helplessness, help, hopeless, helpless condition without the mercy and pardon of the sin bearer, the all sufficiency of Christ can alone enable man to discern his infinite mercy, his immeasurable love, benevolence, and glory. Ellen White, Upward Look, page 155. Portions of the scripture, even whole chapters, may be committed to memory, to be repeated when Satan comes with his temptations, when Satan would lead the mind to dwell upon the earthly and sensual things is most effectually resisted with It is Written, Ellen White, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, April 8, 1884. Yeah. yeah. Guess where she got that idea? Jesus' first words out of his mouth, It, it is, is written. written. It is written. Yeah. The truth about God as displayed in scriptures needs to be lived not just believed. And the one who can make that possible is the Holy Spirit who brings the words of Scripture to new life. It is through the Holy Spirit that we even want to be true followers of God. Of course, the one who illustrates, illustrated that best of all was Jesus Christ himself. Jesus never set aside Scripture as, an, as unimportant in any way. He consistently quoted Scripture as authoritative. It is clear from Scripture that during his ministry, Every night and or early morning, he spent time with his father in prayer and communion, planning for the next day. Mark 1, 35. Every Very early the next morning, long before daylight, Jesus got up and left the house. He went out of the town to a lonely place where he prayed. And then Luke 6, 12-16. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he, whom he called Peter, or he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, John, excuse me, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas were. James were the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Patriot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. Good News Bible. Okay, so now I want you to notice this. He spent the whole night in prayer, because what was he doing the next morning? Name. Choosing the disciples. Choosing, the Choosing disciples. his disciples. You can be sure that he and his father were carefully going over every name Mm. All night long. I'm, I, I, I have no question in my mind, but that's what was uh, happening. Judas, did he come that same day? Uh, Judas came the same day, but the, and the other offered disciples... offered to follow. Yeah, he, he offered to join. And right. Jesus didn't choose him. Right. And when he came in, he wanted to be a, one of the group. And Jesus said, you know, foxes have holes, oh, but oh, the Son of Man has nowhere right. to lay his head. Right. Yes. And he was hoping that, that Judas, as selfish right. as he was, was would go, but he didn't. So you know what happened. Ellen White said that even when there was trouble at his work in the carpenter shop as a young person, 
he would cheer thing up, cheer things up by singing a scripture song, mm. the Zara of Ages 73, paragraph 3. But we are told that not only the spiritually enlightened can understand God's plan for their lives. Gary? Okay. Whoever does not have the Spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from God's Spirit. Such people really do not understand them. They are nonsense to them because their value can be judged only on a spiritual basis. It's from the Good News Bible. This is 2 Peter 1, 19-21. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. And that's from the Good News Bible as well. Now I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Does this mean that uh, we shouldn't ever expect any one person to have to understand the truth or what does mean no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures what is that what's the implications of that well certainly it is you might not necessarily get the full or deepest meaning okay so so what are you supposed to do Get help or read elsewhere in the Bible. Well, and what he's saying here, you need to you need to talk to your friends. Yes. You know, we we need to sit around in a circle like this and say, how do you understand this? What's your you know da da? And that's one of the purposes of of the church for us to come together to discuss things that we we understand jointly, so that we don't we're are not running off chasing some rabbit, as it were. Yes. In the the Berean church, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is Second Timothy three sixteen to seventeen. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful. And then there's a footnote here. Every Scripture inspired by God is also useful. It's useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed, again, from the Good News Bible. Now, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a challenge there I want you all to understand. The Greek says, all scripture, inspired by God, useful. And you have to decide where to put the is's in. And now let's think about who's he writing to here in 2 Timothy? To Timothy. He's writing to Timothy. This is the last book that Paul wrote. Mm. He's in prison in Rome. He knows that he's going to die pretty soon. He's going to be beheaded very shortly. So he's giving final instruction to Timothy. And in Timothy's day, what scriptures would he have available to him? Old Testament. He had the Old Testament. But... And, and some things from, we start, the New Testament was starting to come together, but what form were they? Would they print it out like Jim's Bible over there? Well, if they were written, but by oral, by, because the, the disciples were still, some of them are still alive, so they heard. Yeah, but in those days, every single book would be written as a scroll. Yes. So if you have a Bible, you have a whole pile of scrolls here. Well, then there were a lot of other people. Remember what Luke says in Luke 1. A lot of other people had tried to throw in. There were, if you go, if even now you can read the Old Testament pseudepigrapha and the Old Testament apocrypha and the New Testament uh, apocrypha. There were a lot of other people who wrote books and, and they were claiming to be inspired. So Paul, what Paul is really saying to Timothy is, Timothy, you know which books are inspired. Every scripture inspired by God is also, use, also useful. And you know which ones those are, Timothy. So the every scripture inspired by God is also useful is really a more correct translation. Well, uh, scripture means writings, right? Yeah. So it, just because it's in written down doesn't mean it's true. No. It's the writings that are inspired by God exactly. is what's but useful. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we will neither desire nor appreciate the scriptures. Charles, I think you're next. 
John 15, no, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 15. Yeah. We have not received the word, world spirit. Instead, we have received the spirit sent by God so that we may know all that God has given us. So then, we do not speak in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. As we explain spiritual truths to those who have the spirit, whoever does not have the Spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from God's Spirit. Such people really do not understand them. They are nonsense to them because their value can be judged only, by, only on a spiritual basis. Whoever has the Spirit, however, is able to judge the value of everything, but no one is able to judge him. Good News Bible. Yeah. There are stories coming out of places where you would not expect the Word of God to be read at all, indicating the Holy Spirit continues to speak through the Bible even today and to make the written Word come alive. And Carrie, you would be one of those ones who knows about that. The Adventist World Radio, Adventist World Radio is yes. being broadcast into countries where it's impossible to spread yes. the gospel. There's a story told recently of a, a young lady who heard the message, became convinced, and managed to slip out of North Korea into China yeah. and learned more and more, became an Adventist, committed, con committed Adventist, then tried, went back into in North Korea, and they found out what she was teaching and killed her. Yeah. Yeah. It's happening in the Middle East yeah. by the millions. Yep. Well, John 15, 26. The Helper will come, the Spirit, who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me. And then 1 John 4, 2 and 3. This is how you will be able to know whether it is God's Spirit. Anyone who acknowledges that Jesus Christ came as a human being has a Spirit who comes from God. But anyone who denies this about Jesus does not have the Spirit from God. The Spirit that he has is from the enemy of Christ. You heard what it would, that it would come, and now it is here in the world already. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make the life and teachings of Jesus as well as the meaning of his death clear to human beings. We are told in several places that the Holy Spirit opens the scriptures to our understanding. What does that mean? Well, look at this passage from, um, I guess, Jim, actually that's yours. Then he, that is Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and must rise from, the, from death three days later. Good News Bible. One of the most inspiring things that a person can do is reading the Gospels in connection with Ellen White's book, The Desire of Ages. So what is the best time of the day for you to spend some quiet time with God? Do you really have so many things to do that you need to crowd God out of your life? Ellen White made a beautiful statement. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplating the life of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. How should we respond to those who think that diet is not a big deal so long as they believe in Christ? Or what, what about those who say that being married is just having a piece of paper and that as long as they love Jesus and love each other, that's all that matters? Carrie, <laughs> oh, I guess you get the next one there. Okay. The Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. For the Scriptures explicitly state that the Word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. And that comes by Ellen White from the Great Controversy. Okay. So what have you learned during this quarter and about the Scriptures during this series of lessons? Any things that come, pop, stick out in your mind? I think quite a bit. The fact that if you're not sure, look someplace else. Yeah, and compare Scripture with Scripture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the really important things we learn in this series of lessons is if one part of the Bible, if you can't something understand clearly from this part of the Bible, look elsewhere. Let the Bible interpret itself. 
Yes, Charles. Yes, and uh, I wish we run into trouble, especially sharing with non-Christians, mm -hmm. how to interpret the scriptures. I wish it's, it was how we let the scriptures interpret itself. Yeah. Because that it's not, I'm not involved. It is the scriptures involved. I think that's what we were talking about, the whole, yeah. whole lessons. Yeah. But when we title it, how to interpret it, well, that's your interpretation. I don't care for it kind of yeah. thing. But it's really how beautifully the scriptures interpret yeah. themselves. Yeah. Let, Vanderman used to say, here a little, there a little, if you remember that. I have a collection of littles. <laughs> yeah, but then they, we can run into trouble with that one, though. But the scriptures really truly interpret themselves. That's what I got out of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I really enjoyed this series of lessons. Yes. To, to see how parts come together and you realize, I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, if you study, I'm doing some special study in the book of Revelation, and it refers back repeatedly to things in the Old in the New Testament. The, from, from the fall back there in the beginning chapters of Genesis right to the almost the last chapters of Revelation, and there's a, a perfect tie-in. There, there's no way. One of the things that I really have enjoyed about this series, this series of lessons is that the only reason it fits together so well, all from beginning to end, is because it has one author. Amen. There's no way you could take 40 different people all of the men, believe it or not. Over 1,600 years. Yeah, over 1,600 years, and have them write something down, have it all agree in perfect harmony. Amen. Yeah, it's not possible. Which leads me to um, enter just one thing as we're, we're in our last few minutes. Is there any part of the Bible written by women? By a woman? Yeah. In the Old Testament, I think. Now we have some. Some books named after right, women, Ruth, Esther yes, but, and Ruth. Right. But what about any actual one written by a woman? What's that hold? Uh, let's see. And I quote from Proverbs 31. These are the solemn words which King Lemuel's mother said to him. Ah. <laughs> the, whole, the whole 31st chapter of Proverbs is from King Lemuel's mother. Mother. Wow. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the study of these lessons as much as we have and have come to appreciate the scriptures more and, and, and committed yourself to set aside a time every day when you and God can work together. Amen. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have these words before us in such wonderful format. And now with these electronic devices we have before us with we can compare scripture with scripture just instantly. We can look up any books we want to look up, uh, any, any any place in any book, and and have commentaries and everything all in one neat, organized place. And yet, with all that before us, with all the help we have from Ellen White, for example, what are we doing with all this wealth? Mm -hmm. Are we really sharing it with the world? And we know that in our future lessons, we'll be talking about how we what we need to do and how we need to do it to share this good news with the whole world. May you guide us as we look forward to those lessons and study them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.